Hello and good evening. My name is Jim Kibitza. I am a volunteer on the Board of Directors uh, with the ASF. I reside in Cheshire, Connecticut with my beautiful wife, Jen, and sons, Lincoln, who's 12, and Cole, who is 10. Um, Cole was diagnosed with Angerman syndrome in June of 2012. Uh, I'm proud to be here tonight to present to you Dr. Jessica Dewis. And I have a couple notes. I apologize for this. I scroll up on my screen. Uh, Dr. Dewis started the ASF Angelman Syndrome Clinic at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. She is now the head of the new ASF Angelman Syndrome Clinic uh, at Children's Hospital Colorado. She is an associate pro uh, assistant professor at the University of Colorado uh, School of Medicine teaching pediatrics, clinical genetics, and metabolism. So I present to you Dr. Jessica Dewis. Well, I'm going to be talking tonight about um, ketogenic diet and low glycemic index therapy, as well as supplements. And, um, and when I was preparing for this presentation, I actually asked some parents what it was they would like to hear about. And so I do have a pretty large list of supplements that I'm going to go through um, and uh, as pretty quickly, but certainly if anybody has any questions, you can always um, ask them on the webinar, and I'm always happy to take emails um, after the presentation. So why do we even consider diet therapy for Angelman syndrome? And there's been a lot of work on this, That's uh, a lot of which has come out of um, Massachusetts General Hospital, showing that low glycemic index treatment um, in particular can be very successful in treating seizures and changing EEG patterns um, for individuals with Angelman syndrome. There's also been some work done on some supplements that um, with the goal of increasing the level of ketosis that have shown that there may be other benefits beyond seizures for diet, um, including um, some developmental and behavioral impact as well. So this is why in our clinic, um, and we encourage many to always talk about diet with uh, families who have kids with Angelman syndrome, because we do feel like it has a lot of impact even beyond seizures for kids who don't have um, seizures. So we're still trying to understand the mechanism of how the ketogenic diet works. Um, and so um, there's this is slide three as you get this kind of set up, but basically we think that it impacts the um, balance between the inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain called GABA and the activating neurotransmitter in the brain called glutamine. And we know that there is already an imbalance of these neurotransmitters in Angelman syndrome. And so our goal with ketogenic diet is that it tips that balance more towards um, GAB, GABA as a neurotransmitter in the brain, which is, like I said, inhibitory. And so um, it also plays a role in inhibiting um, neurotransmission by glutamine by um, activating um, transporters in the brain. So it, there's also a lot of information about um, the function of the powerhouse of the cell called the mitochondria and Angelman syndrome. And we think that the ketogenic diet helps stabilize that part of the cell that may not be functioning properly in Angelman syndrome. So there's different types of ketogenic diets that we think about um, or types of diets that decrease the amount of carbohydrates and increase the amount of protein and fat in the diet. So a typical regular diet has quite a bit of carbohydrates. Um, and as we move towards low glycemic index therapy, we focus more on fats and um, low glycemic index carbohydrates, which we're going to talk about, as well, and then increase the ratio of protein. And as you get more strict through the ketogenic diets, you're increasing the fat in particular to higher levels of fat. So when we think about these diets, the ketogenic diet, which is less than 10 grams of carbohydrates a day is the most restrictive. Um, and when we think about low glycemic index therapy, we're really focusing on those healthy types of carbohydrates, the low glycemic index carbohydrates, 
um, but we're still limiting carbohydrates significantly to 40 to 60 grams per day. And then the modified Atkins is, is in between that at 10 to 20 grams of net carbs per day. So when you're going, thinking about going on diet, we often do a pretty extensive evaluation, um, get some labs and make sure that it's safe to go on to the ketogenic diet. And there'll often be supplements that we'll recommend to help get on diet. So this is just meant to be a pretty exhaustive list of the things we think about when we're thinking about going on diet. So I'm on slide five. Sorry about this, guys. Um, and I'm going to slide. So this would be that exhaustive list that we often think about. So slide six, um, next slide. So when we talk about ketogenic diet therapy, I'll start with kind of the most tricks. So when we talk about different Different ratios, so four to one or three to one, we're talking about the ratio of fat to carbohydrate and protein. And so we often will start with a three to one ketogenic diet if we want to go into the full um, ketogenic diet. And so that would be three grams of fat for every three grams of fat, there would be one gram of protein and carbohydrate. And I mentioned MCT because we definitely use a lot of MCT, which I'm going to talk about when we're um, talking about supplements as well. But MCT can inc is a, a good type of fat called medium chain triglycerides and can also increase the level of ketosis. So help get the child into ketosis faster. Um, and, and, you know, what we see in Angelman syndrome, which really came through when, when we did the nutritional trial is that kids with Angelman, if you have a pretty high fat content in the diet, they actually are often in ketosis, even if they're on a regular standard American diet. Next slide. So there's other things that we think about when we think about ketone levels. And like I said, there's, you know, in Angelman syndrome in particular, there seems to be a very high level of ketosis with fasting. We're not really sure why that is. It may be that metabolism is increased in individuals with Angelman syndrome. There's still some work that needs to be done there. But um, so things like fasting, certainly if you're ill um, and you're not eating well, you can um, have a higher level of ketosis. And then when you're growing, other things that people don't really think about associated with elevated ketones would be constipation and then other products, even things that you put on your skin can have some carbohydrates in them that can impact your level of ketosis if you're on diet. Next slide. So whenever you're thinking about starting the diet, we always recommend talking with a dietitian and a physician. Um, and we usually, like I said, start at that three to one ratio. So three grams of fat for every one gram of carbohydrates and protein. We often start the diet orally um, and we'll recommend small frequent meals. Um, and certainly we can do it in tube fed individuals as well with special formulas that are made for ketogenic diet. Next slide. So if you're going on a strict ketogenic diet, then you really want to start measuring everything, weighing everything, um, using meats that are lean, so skinless, trim the fat before you weigh the meat. Um, fruits should always be fresh. And then you want to start reading food labels to get a sense of how much carbohydrate, fat, and protein are in um, different things that you want to try on the diet. Next slide. And, you know, it is confusing, but a lot of foods that say light tend to have a lot of um, added carbohydrates in them. Avoid, you want to try to make everything at home or have everything be natural where there's not a lot of additives, where there could be carbohydrates that come into those. Next slide. And then, of course, you want to make sure that there's plenty of water. So if you're doing some of the formulas and you're using a tube, for example, you want to make sure that you're giving plenty of water through the tube as well to help prevent some things like constipation. Next slide.
So this is a typical diet, and I just put this in here so you have it as a reference, but you can see that there's a lot of very high fat foods, heavy whipping cream at almost every meal and snack. Um, definitely fruit can be included in high fiber fruits like strawberries or other berries are the best ones. Lots of eggs, cheese, butter, so dairy products um, outside of milk that don't have many carbohydrates. Um, and so this is a good example of a well-balanced ketogenic diet for someone who's five years old. Next slide. So modified Atkins, I'm not going to talk too much about, but it's a little bit liberalized version of the ketogenic diet, still low carbohydrate, high fat, and adequate protein. Um, and this is 10 to 20 grams of net carbs per day, with net carbs being total carbohydrates minus the fiber. Next slide. So I'm going to focus quite a bit on the low glycemic index therapy because I think that this is a really great diet for individuals with Angelman syndrome, whether or not they have seizures. So again, another high fat, low carbohydrate diet and the glycemic index, which here's an example of that hopefully you can make bigger on your screen um, that shows the different levels of glycemic indices. So anything below 50 is considered a low glycemic index food. And those are the foods that we really focus on when we're counting those four 40 to 60 grams of, of carbs per day. And basically what the glycemic index is, is it, it tells us how much a food will increase your child's blood sugar when they take that food into the body. Um, and so again, we're looking for less than 50. Next slide. So I usually actually start this diet pretty slowly for families and I, I just slowly start cutting out simple sugars in the diet at first, thinking about some of those hidden carbohydrates like barbecue sauce um, that could be in the diet and then really focusing on just transitioning the carbohydrates in the child's diet to low glycemic index carbohydrates. While we do that, we also tend to increase the fat in the diet, um, often we'll augment with MCT oil to help with that. And so it's not a, I tend, my philosophy with it is to start out slowly, start introducing the ideas of the low glycemic index therapy without worrying as much about counting the 40 to 60 grams of carbs per day. Next slide. And so these are just a, a list of recommended foods with um, low glycemic for a low glycemic index diet. And you can see there is quite a lot of overlap with ketogenic diet, but it does allow for um, some liberalization like legumes um, and um, a broader range of vegetables and fruits with a low glycemic index. Next slide. And here's a sample diet again, just more for your reference if you want to go back to it. So what are we looking at here? We want your child to get the typical number of calories that are appropriate for age. We're keeping those carbohydrates between the 40 to 60. This is a little bit less um, than that um, in this particular plan, but typically we try to get to up to that 40 range. Um, and then uh, still a lot of fat in the diet. So 70% of total calories is fat and then um, still quite a bit of protein in the diet. Next slide. So we do monitor lab work, not as much with the low glycemic index therapy, although we do like to make sure that, that um, electrolytes are balanced, that we're making sure that liver function remains normal and that, you know, you can have low blood glucoses when you switch diet over. So we monitor glucoses and other um, vitamins that can be uh, low when people are on these special diets such as uh, carnitine, which I'm also going to talk about a little bit later. Um, the labs also could help us get a good picture of effectiveness of therapy and how much the child is going into ketosis, so we'll monitor those ketone levels in the blood um, and sometimes even use urine sticks to monitor that. Um, and you know, we can adjust things. So there are kids with Angelman syndrome that I've seen, even on low glycemic index therapy, get into significant ketosis. And if that's the case, we can titrate up the carbohydrates or change the, the fat ratio to try to um, get the level of ketones down. Um, you know, the theory with the low 
glycemic index therapy is that most kids are not in ketosis, but it still has those significant benefits um, that have been shown for Angelman syndrome. Next slide. So I always like to talk about starting diet. So if you wanna be on diet right from the beginning after your child starts to transition, to solids. So first of all, you want to make sure that there's head control and it's safe to introduce solids. I usually have people start with pu purees and usually a green vegetable is a good place to start. Um, and then you just want to do one new food at a time, paying attention to those glycemic indices. Um, and it can really help to have a dietitian that you're working with who you can be in contact with frequently. Next slide. So, you know, poor growth can be a problem, especially early on in Angelman syndrome. And when you're transitioning diet, sometimes we have kids lose a significant amount of weight. And I really recommend that you consider doing some of the supplemental formulas. So a lot of times we'll actually use some almond milk, but the challenge with almond milk is that it just doesn't have a lot of nutritional um, value. Um, and so for kids, especially who are still you know, taking significant amount of supplemental milk, we recommend using some of the formulas that are available from either Keto V or Keto Cal. And then adding the MCT both gives calories, but like I said, can help push thing, push kids into ketosis, which will help with the management, usually of seizures, but again, there's other benefits that we think for the diet. Next slide. So the diet does have side effects and we're talking more specifically now about um, a three to one or four to one ketogenic diet where we're more likely to see some of these challenges. So dehydration, so you wanna make sure that you're getting plenty of water in with the diet. Blood sugar can also drop. And so often it used to be that we would monitor kids in the hospital, um, making sure that their uh, blood sugar remained normal. But nowadays we feel comfortable doing the diet at home and monitoring at home. Some kids, especially with Angelman, can get excessive ketosis, and this can lead to an increased amount of acid in the blood. So one thing we've started to do is um, supplement with something called bicitra, which will help with that with that balance of acid in the blood. Um, there can also be abdominal symptoms. In particular, I would say we see constipation, but can be abdominal pain and vomiting um, that we have to monitor and sometimes um, leads us to change to a less strict diet if that's something that we're seeing. Next slide. So again, GI side effects, I'm just gonna quickly go through all the side effects. Um, you know, when you have a lot of fat in your diet, it slows emptying and in particular, constipation is something we keep a close eye on. Um, there are instances in which you can have um, some inflammation in your liver and your pancreas. Um, I've actually not seen this before unless kids have been on um, Depakote or Valproic acid while also doing the diet. Um, so that is very rare. Definitely constipation is a big issue. Um, the big things that really help with constipation can be MCT oil, um, magnesium, and um, I think I included that in the supplements, but if not, there's something called oxy powder that I found to be very helpful, which is just um, magnesium citrate. And then um, the other thing that sometimes we use is aloe juice, which works really well as well. Next slide. Kidney stones, I also have not seen kids get kidney stones on the diet, but it's certainly listed as a risk. Um, you can give potassium citrate if someone's getting a lot of stones to try to, to prevent them. And then some, sometimes we do measure the urine calcium um, in the compared to the creatinine, which is put out by the kidney to see if there's signs that there could be kidney stones developing. Next slide. So growth and vitamin deficiencies are things that we monitor. And again, this is more for a pretty strict ketogenic diet, monitoring growth. Um, calcium and vitamin D are low on this type of diet because it's so high fat. And so we want to make sure that we're supplementing with both of those. Um, some people have recommended getting regular x-rays um, or, or um, 
DEXA scans, which look at the density of the bone. Um, I've not typically done that, but it's definitely mentioned in the literature. And then you want to make sure that the child's on a low carbohydrate multivitamin like Nano VM is a good one um, that have plenty of calcium and vitamin D. Um, carnitine deficiency can occur. So carnitine is really important for how we get energy from our fats um, in our body. And so that if that vitamin is low, then that can be a problem. Um, and so that's something I typically check if we're going to do ketogenic diet. Um, it also may be helpful to treat with carnitine to prevent um, high levels of lipids. Um, and then, you know, there have been some case reports of um, enlargement of the heart and a difference in heart rhythm um, that, that can be due to a selenium deficiency. And so I always just make sure they're on a vitamin with selenium in it. And if we're getting labs, I at least check that selenium once. Next slide. So dyslipidemia I talked about a little bit, but this is just high levels of um, cholesterol and triglycerides in the blood. Um, there are things that we can do to prevent this. So using that MCT oil has been shown to be beneficial. Um, we sometimes have to go on a less strict diet so that we can come down a little bit on how much fat is in the diet. And then that carnitine supplementation is something just to keep in mind. Next slide. So there are other considerations if you're on a pretty strict ketogenic diet. So you want to um, be careful if your child goes into the hospital and they're dehydrated. You want to make sure that the hospital knows that they shouldn't be getting sugar-containing fluids um, or after surgery. Um, sometimes we do stop the ketogenic diet if kids are very sick. I've never had anybody have a reaction to propofol, but again, it's something listed as a concern um, because propofol does have a pretty high fat content as well. Um, and then oh, you just want to watch over-the-counter medications can have a lot of carbohydrates in particular. Um, if your child gets a um, prescription for an antibiotic, um, you want to make sure that they know that they're on the ketogenic diet. Next slide. Um, and then again, just some special considerations if your child has a fever or illness. Um, a lot of times we recommend and make sure kids have backup rescue medications at home like clonazepam and diazepam that we start if kids have fever or are appearing sick. And that can really help too. Um, but you just wanna make sure that if you're giving anything to reduce fever that it doesn't have a lot of sugar in it because if you kick your child gets kicked out of ketosis and that's something that's helping to control seizures and you have a lower seizure threshold because of fevers, then it's possible that they could get very sick and have significant seizures. So you just wanna be cognizant of that. Next slide. So I'm gonna go through quite a few supplements pretty quickly. Um, just These are the ones that um, parents mentioned to me and that I've seen um, parents ask questions about or so I just want to go through as many of them as I can in a timely way. <laughs> Next slide. So MCT oil and if anybody um, sees me they know that I'm a big believer in MCT oil. I think it really does help both with the balance of getting kids to switch over metabolism so that they're um, in ketosis which definitely has benefits um, that as we've talked about but there's also been a patent that was through Nestle that looked at um, how medium chain triglycerides impact the gene UBE3A, which of course missing mom's copy of the gene UBE3A causes Angelman syndrome. And so there's been, there was a big patent that was submitted and some of their data was pretty convincing that MCT improves cognitive performance, um, as well as um, increases that expression of UBE3A. So there has been kind of mixed data on the role of um, MCT oil, whether it's C8 or C10. So typical MCT oil that you buy at the health food store over the counter is going to be a mixture of 50% C8 and 50% C10. Um, 
And there's been some data to suggest that maybe isolated C8, which is also called caprylic acid triglycerides, is better for Angelman syndrome. I put on here graphs of the data from the Nestle patent, and you can see that both C8 and C10 increased expression of UBE3A um, as you increase the doses of it. But there was data presented a couple of years ago at an ASF conference um, um, from Dr. Phil Potts' group that said maybe in the mouse model, it looked like there was benefit from C8 and much less benefit or concerns about C10. So some people have asked about C8 versus C10. I I'm inclined to think there's not a difference. I've seen, I feel like I've heard and seen benefits from the mixture, but you can certainly buy C8 and it's not dangerous to just do C8. And so I'll often start at a pretty low dose, one teaspoon daily, and then you can titrate up as tolerated. The biggest side effect from this is going to be um, GI upset and, and diarrhea. So you just want to watch for that, but it, it does work really well for constipation for most kids. Next slide. So levocarnitine is one, um, as we've talked about, looking at the carnitine level. And so certainly when on diet, um, we monitor the carnitine level and sometimes recommend um, carnitine if that level is low. Um, so it, it may be helpful for that dyslipidemia. There have been a lot of studies now looking at autism being connected with carnitine deficiency. It's certainly protective if you, your child is on Depakote or Valproate to the liver toxicity that we can see. Um, so I, I usually check a level of carnitine and certainly if it's low, we'll uh, supplement that, especially if kids are on diet. But it also plays a pretty critical role in energy production from fat. And so, um, if people, you know, if pe people ask me about it, I think it's safe to try it. Um, and typically, we'll do a dose of 50 milligrams per kilogram divided in two doses a day. Um, so, if people are interested, I typically tell them don't implement multiple supplements at once, give each one two weeks, see if you see a benefit and then introduce another one. So this is sometimes a supplement that people try. Next slide. Coenzyme Q10. So um, coenzyme Q10 is a vitamin that's very important for the respiratory chain in our mitochondria. So the mitochondria are the powerhouses in our cells. And in order to make energy throughout our body, we need to transfer um, protons along the um, respiratory chain. And this is getting a little technical, but coenzyme Q10 is very important for that transfer of um, electrons across that, that um, respiratory chain. So um, there was a study that looked at administration of coenzyme Q10 in an animal model of Angelman syndrome with a maternal deletion. And it showed that there was a benefit um, in the, those mice in both um, motor coordination and anxiety. Um, and so coenzyme Q10 is another thing that's pretty safe. Um, so as uh, families have asked me about this, especially since there's some literature in mice. And so this is another option for a trial. Next slide. Um, so there's a lot of talk about the gut um, brain axis and the role of gut microbiota um, on the on cognition and other um, things related to neurological de development. And so in particular, this is mostly again in the autism world, but there seems to be some role of how the gut interacts with the neurological system um, that plays a role in um, some behavioral features in particular. And so we often will recommend a probiotic or prebiotic for individuals who have constipation. So prebiotics are out there more and more, and that's more like a fertilizer to help the current gut flora grow and flourish. Um, an example of that would be inositol. And, they, and then 
probiotics, that should say, um, establish new bacteria. And there's been specifically data on B. fragilis in autism in um, taking probiotics can be beneficial for symptoms around behavior, especially. Um, and so taking both of these can help reestablish healthy gut flora and may also help with constipation. Next slide. So this is um, true macro, which is um, an exogenous ketone beta hydroxybutyrate plus MCT. And this is the study that we completed um, that, that was funded by uh, FAST. Um, and we worked with uh, disruptive enterprises um, to run a trial. And we had 13 patients complete a trial using this um, supplement. And what we saw we're still in the process of analyzing, but the data is pretty exciting. So we did see that there was a change in delta power with a large effect in some patients. So that background EEG that we see in Angelman syndrome did seem to be changed by this. We don't know what that means um, in terms of clinical significance yet, but we did see that in many patients there was a change there. Um, also in the event-related potential, which is similar to an EEG, except we have a child put on probes um, like they would be getting an EEG, but then look at their um, brain activity and their cognition. And we did see statistically significant change in a part of the brain in the, the frontal region of the brain. Um, we also saw that this helped with constipation, which may be that MCT component. Um, and then, you know, a lot of subtypes of Angelman syndrome in particular can have food seeking. So in particular, kids seeking carbohydrates. Um, you, some parents sometimes notice that kids can, you know, if they would let them, they would eat a whole box of donuts. And so one of the things we also saw that was significant um, is that there was an impact on appetite and that food seeking. And so kids in the study, some of them uh, where parents noticed that did lose weight, which was indicated for that for those particular individuals. So pretty exciting, but we're still working on analyzing. Next slide. Taurine is of interest recently because of a paper that was published in a mouse model of Angelman, Angelman syndrome that showed that it recovered motor capacity and learning and memory skills. Um, and so this is Taurine is also known to be um, increase the level of GABA, like we talked about earlier, that inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. And so that might be the mechanism. Um, and so we have some families who have wanted to try it, and it's a pretty broad dose range. So definitely talk with your doctor um, if you're interested in trying it. But it's very safe. Um, there we have there's no really reported side effects up to 3,000 milligrams a day in, a, in adults. Next slide. L-threonine is one that a, a parent brought up with me that I don't usually think about, but it's certainly being used in other neurological disorders to treat stiffness um, that's neuro neurologically mediated. So it has to do with um, spasticity or, um, and so it, th there are many reported benefits. Um, there's no specific data in Angelman syndrome, um, but there is some report in uh, kids with autism that it may be helpful for anxiety. Next slide. Black currant is out there, um, and there's a lot of parents who ask questions about it. Um, parents have seen improvements in uh, behavior and co significant cognitive process. Um, and the doses that the company has been recommending for kids with Angelman are one capsule a day for deletion kids, and then a capsule every other day for other subtypes. There is some report that there could be an increased anxiety when you're on this. Um, they now have it available as a powder and there's no specific published data on uh, black current at this time. Next slide. B vitamins. So we we definitely use a lot of B6, which can help with irritability associated with the use of Keppra or Luvitera acetam. B12 is really important for neurological development. And you know, in a lot of kids where we check the B12 level, it can be pretty elevated in Angelman syndrome, even though kids are not on it. And we're not sure if that 
that's because they don't effectively use it um, or why that might be. Um, there was a big study that was looking at remethylation. So um, as many of you may know, when you get tested for Angelman, we're looking at methylation tests and there's um, problems with the balance of how we turn on moms versus dad's genes in chromosome 15 that methylation plays a role there. So there was a study in 2012 in humans looking at multiple of these supplements that may play a role there and B12 was one of them and it did not show an impact. B12 though is pretty safe so having high levels does not seem to be dangerous. Next slide. Melatonin. So um, many of us use melatonin to help with getting to sleep at night. It's a hormone that's naturally produced in the brain, um, so very safe to use and it initiates sleep. It is not effective to keep kids asleep after they fall asleep, but can be helpful um, with routine at bedtime. Next slide. DHA. Um, which is an omega-3 fatty acid, is really important for brain development during pregnancy and early childhood. Um, and some products have it added. So if you ever use Fairlife milk or other milk products, some of them have DHA added to them. Um, and those are pretty low carbohydrate milks because um, they're ultra-filtered milk. Um, so maybe safe to use on a low glycemic index therapy. Um, there was a study looking at a DHA and an Angelman fly and showed that the fly was better able to climb um, when it went on DHA. Next slide. Iron, so it's really important um, to check iron stores ferritin, especially in kids who have restless leg syndrome or restless sleep, because um, that has been shown to play a role there. Um, I often, try to increase foods that have high levels of iron um, before I imp implement a supplement just because the supplements can make constipation much worse. Um, but a lot of times we are having to add a supplement um, even if temporarily to get those iron stores back up and it can be really helpful for the restless sleep and Angelman syndrome. Next slide. Okay, that's it. So I left some time for questions um, and I'm always happy to answer things in more detail or provide more information if you wanna email me. Thank you all for your attention. Okay, Dr. Can you hear me? Okay, I just yeah. wanna make sure. <laughs> okay, um, thanks everyone for bearing with us. We had some technical difficulties there in the beginning. Um, do have some questions um, and I'll start going through those and if anyone, um, you know, while you're listening has more questions, go ahead and uh, send them in. Um, so the first two questions are similar and they have to do with picky eaters. So how would you suggest transitioning a picky eater or um, a child that just doesn't like to eat meat? Is it still possible to transition to LGIT or how do you go about that? Yeah, so it is definitely possible. Um, it's helpful to work with a dietitian, certainly, but um, eggs can be really helpful if they'll eat eggs. Um, and then higher fat foods um, don't necessarily have to be meats either. So um, adding that heavy whipping cream to stuff, adding butter when you're cooking stuff, um, and then focusing on those low glycemic index therapy, if you're if you're going that route instead of a strict ketogenic diet, you can um, implement a lot of those foods that would include things like high fiber fruits and lots of different vegetables, which the vegetables might not be helpful if they're picky. Um, but there's definitely a lot of variety in recipes um, where you can kind of sneak things in, um, you know, using cauliflower for rice or cauliflower now noodles or um, so there's def definitely um, options for things that kids like to eat making them more um, LGIT or ketogenic friendly. Okay um, the next one is going to test my pronunciation skills. Do you ever see uh, dyslipidemia 
in individuals with AS, even if they are not on a prescribed low carb diet. Yes, I feel like we see it frequently, um, especially in um, early adolescence. Um, and, you know, we'll often recommend transitioning to leaner meats, which can really help. Um, it is challenging if someone's on a diet just because getting the fat down to where you want it to be without um, having those high lipids can be challenging. But we treatment with carnitine can help. Um, and then also just slimming down the diet, um, transitioning as much as possible to some of those low glycemic index foods that are that are healthier and leaner could be helpful. Okay. Um, do MCT, levocarnitine, and or coenzyme Q10 potentially help with the UPD transmission? You know, I, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to really understand the benefit of these, um, these supplements, um, but yes. But I, I have been uh, recommending MCT in particular um, in all subtypes. And I do feel like, um, if nothing else, it's been really beneficial for constipation, which we all know that in Angelman syndrome, constipation can also play a role in other things like worsening seizures. Um, but I, I think it's beneficial um, and still, um, even if it's not, the mechanism is slightly different than what we think it is. I've definitely seen it be beneficial. Um, and coenzyme Q10 and levocarnitine have a slightly different mechanism of action where they're not really impacting UBE3A directly, but maybe some downstream effects of not having a functional mom's copy of UBE3A. So, um, you know, that powerhouse of the cell. Um, may not be working properly, and some of the data in animal models has showed that. And so 
if that's the case, that that would help for all the subtypes of Angelman syndrome. Okay. Um, this is a great question. Um, when you are wanting or interested to uh, to add supplements, what kind of a doctor or specialist would you talk to? A pediatrician, neurologist, a dietitian? Good question. Um, your pediatrician can be helpful. Um, it, I think it really helps to talk with someone who has some background knowledge um, about Angelman and, you know, because a lot of these supplements that I went through actually, at least in animal models, have uh, some benefits um, related specifically to Angelman syndrome. So it may be helpful to talk with someone who has some background there or um, provide that education to whoever you're talking to. But, um, you know, and a, I would say general pediatrician and dietitian, and if you're seen in any of the Angelman clinics, um, certainly bringing it up with um, whoever kind of takes on the role of um, kind of that general pediatric role, but having that knowledge of Angelman syndrome, um, which could be a neurologist or a geneticist. Okay. Um, does dairy or especially sugar generally play a negative role in the diet of those with AS? So there are a lot of people with AS who have a dairy sensitivity. Um, and so that that can be an issue. And sometimes we've seen kids have worse seizures or rashes or kind of um, more obscure manifestations of having a dairy allergy. Um, and so coming off of dairy can help with managing other aspects of Angelman syndrome um, in some individuals. Um, when you're on one of these diets, you have to be really careful, particularly with milk itself. So like I mentioned, if you're on low glycemic index therapy, there are some higher protein ultra filtered milks. Um, the one that comes to mind is Fair Life. Um, and then, um, and, and so those can be added safely to a low glycemic index therapy if you're just watching the carbs because a cup of that has six grams of car of carbohydrates. Um, in, in the ketogenic diet, especially if you're on a strict ketogenic diet and you're trying to to keep to less than 10 carbohydrates, actually drinking milk can be a problem. Um, sugar in and of itself, I think, is not necessarily dangerous, um, but we certainly see better seizure control and potentially other benefits from being on a low sugar diet. Um, so that said, we have many families that we follow. Like I have, you know, we have a family who has to put the child's medications in a Twinkie for them to take it. And so, you know, the diet is not necessarily for everybody. And so sometimes, you know, you have to balance quality of life with, um, with take, you know, with going on a, a diet that would limit things um, that make life possible. So you, you kind of have to balance those things, but sugar in and of itself is not necessarily dangerous we just don't think that you get that added benefit of kind of transitioning your metabolism to um, ketones if you're getting a lot of sugar however i do have to qualify that too and that's a long answer with the fact that if you get a lot of fat in the diet we see a lot of kids who are on standard american diet her family does try to eat clean but they get plenty of carbohydrates in the diet but they also get upwards of above 30% of fat in the diet. And especially if you're using MCT and you're getting good fats like avocado, um, you can still have some level of ketosis in kids with Angelman. So it's just that balance and figuring out what works for your child. Okay, um, there was another question that was a little bit specific about seizures. So um, her daughter was on the keto diet for three years and started having breakthrough seizures. Um, they have the seizures under control now with CBD oil and Onfi. 
O-N-F-I, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Okay. Um, have you ever experienced um, seizures suddenly um, with a keto diet? And the second part of the question is, does the diet stop working over time? So in answer to the first question, certainly we do see kids have breakthrough seizures on the ketogenic diet. Um, sometimes that's related to lab abnormalities. So certainly we can, we would, if, if we were seeing you would recommend getting a whole bunch of labs, making sure your child doesn't have that acid buildup in the blood. Um, Cause those are things that we can treat. Um, with medications um, and can certainly contribute to having an increased likelihood of seizures. Um, the, you know, there are side effects to being on the ketogenic diet lifelong. Um, so as kids get older, um, you know, we typically recommend trying to liberalize to that low glycemic index therapy, particularly because for most kids, especially once they're through puberty, their um, seizures tend to get better. And so we encourage families to try to liberalize a little, at least to that low glycemic index therapy um, because of the long-term side effects of being on the diet, things like uh, particularly bone health, um, where you can have brittle bones. So, um, but we also do have kids who stay on the diet, who have stayed on the diet lifelong and are doing very well. We just keep, continue to monitor for some of those um, side effects, nutrient deficiencies. Selenium is one that people don't often think about, but can uh, be a problem and also cause breakthrough seizures. And then does the diet, the second part, does the diet stop working over time? Oh, I, um, I don't think it stops working. I think that you can get you get more, more side effects from it. Um, and so some of those side effects can play a role in having um, in having worsening seizures or breakthrough seizures. And so you just want to make sure someone's monitoring for those side effects and treating them appropriately. But okay. we haven't seen that it stops working over time necessarily. There's usually something that's off that we just need to figure out what it is. Um, and then last question is timing on supplements. Can they be given while you're transitioning to a keto or LGIT? Um, or can they be given only when the child is 100% on either diet? So you can give supplements no matter what diet the child's on. The one thing I would say is if you're, I don't let, I don't want you to, people to transition too many things at once. So if you're getting on the diet, I would do that first and then get solidly on the diet for a few weeks and then try adding a supplement with the exception of things that augment the diet, like MCT, you could implement at the same time you're going on diet, but you, you want to try to make only one change, give it a few weeks and then make another change so that you're um, making sure that if something gets worse or something gets better, you know what helped. Okay, and then one more. Is the goal of the keto or LGID diet to eliminate seizure medications? And if so, how soon after transitioning uh, to 100% of either diet should the doctor be consulted to begin tapering off medications? So it, oftentimes, and in general for seizure management, oftentimes people will consider the diet for seizures after the the child is on multiple medications um, and it's just not working and so they'll transition to the diet. Um, yes, oftentimes once you get on diet, you can wean off some of the, the seizure medications. And I usually give the diet a good few months, like three months, um, to monitor the child if, this, if the seizures are getting much better. And especially if the EEG, if there's um, seizure activity specifically on the EEG is getting better, then, then we, we, we will wean the medications off at that point. 
Um, if your child's seizures are well controlled with medicine, is there a need to alter their diet? This is a, this is a great question. Um, you know, I I be really believe that the diet has other benefits outside of seizures, um, especially the low glycemic index therapy. I think has a lot of benefits for Angelman syndrome, even if your child's seizure free. Um, so we tend to talk about it with every single family that comes into our clinic um, because I think it's worth trying to see if you you see other benefits in your, your child. Okay, that was, that was our last question. Um, I will go ahead and leave the, um, the webinar on for a little bit. That way, if anyone, you know, thinks of a question later, um, you can feel free to type that in and we can send those over to um, Dr. Dewis and she can get them answered. Um, and then uh, I'm trying to think. The other thing is if you think of something tomorrow, send it into um, info at angelman.org and we can get those answered um, by Dr. Dewis that way also. Um, and I think we're just about done and Jim just wanted to wrap up for us. Got it. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate it. Um, Dr. Dewis as well. And I'll tell you something from um, always listening to these uh, webinars and presentations, no matter where uh, you hear them or see them, you always learn something new. Um, even if you're new to the community or you've been in the community for a long time, uh, there's always something new or something that just came up or whatnot and it's always nice to hear uh, stuff like that so I appreciate the uh, the webinar tonight uh, Dr. Dewis and uh, thank you very much for watching our virtual palooza thank you thank you so much for having me um, and I'm always happy to take emails if anybody has any more questions as well